This is Corolla Digital. Hello, my little Jordan almonds. It's me, Allison. Before the show officially starts, a few words. Um, I have an exciting announcement, which is that we're trying something new. Uh, we are offering premium content. It is a bonus episode. I did my show live at the LA Podcast Festival, and my guests were Doug Benson and Greg Proops. And we are making this show available as a bonus episode. It'll be $1.99. We've turned it into iTunes, and so we're just waiting for it to go live in the store. So to find it, if you just search my name or their names uh, in the well, in iTunes, but it'll be in the comedy album section. So I will definitely announce when it is available, um, but you guys can be checking too. That's so uh, I'm excited. I hope you guys like it, Gary. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, just it's not going to be uh, it's not going to come up as a podcast. Right. So you have to go into the iTunes store and search for Allison Rosen. But uh, it should be pretty easy to find, and we'll we'll tweet and Facebook when it's uh, when it's actually live. Yes, uh, I believe we have some iTunes comments of the week. Allison wants your iTunes comments. Allison wants them. Yes, she does. Please leave her some iTunes comments, and don't forget to click five stars. All right, our first iTunes comment of the week comes from Todd Finley, and it's titled "The Secret to Allison Rosen Is Ellipses." And it starts, ellipses, that she is a memorist who sensitive... Six dots? Yeah. Okay. That she is a memorist who sensitively articulates how the world is perceived through her unique mind. Her jokes are absurd and quickly quirky. In a medium that is dominated by hypermale and aggressive personalities, she dares to be real, hesitant sometimes, and raw. The result? Her consciousness lingers in the air like an expensive perfume. Oh, Todd Finley. Don't stop. Um, thank you so much. It sounds like an obsession ad, and, uh, and I like it. Okay, what else? All right, the next one is by John T. 7303, and it's titled, A Show That Really Lives Up to Its Title. This is a great interview podcast. Allison has interesting guests and somehow has them open up in ways that you, wouldn't, you won't hear in any other mainstream interview. It's like they're two close friends hanging out at her house, going deep, and you're there too. And you really feel it through the course of the interview. It's a, very sens- it's a very satisfying and definitely not a waste of time. So have a listen and give her a chance to entertain you. Also, Allison is smart, funny, and interesting, all without trying too hard. After discovering her on Adam Carolla's show, I gave her a chance, and now I'm a big fan. Well, he's absolutely right about everything. Thank you, John, letters, numbers. All right. And finally, this is from uh, KTQ101. As a 16-year-old girl, I don't have a lot of friends interested in topics discussed on Allison Rosen's new best friend. So I must admit that it's nice to take an hour or two out of my week to pretend that I'm I'm a grown-up and really chill with Allison and Gary. I sometimes find myself wanting to talk to my iPhone when Allison asks an especially interesting question or reveals something unique about herself. Basically, Allison is my hero, and every Monday I'm pumped to hang out with her. Oh, thank you! I think I would have listened to us when I was 16. I would have listened to Future Me. Would you have? Just say yes, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what were you into when you were 16, Gary? I listened to Loveline a lot. Yeah. Yeah. See, we're kind of like that, but kind of different. Anyway, um, thanks, everyone. And, and, and if you left a comment and I didn't read it, but I loved it anyway, I want you to know that. Um, if you would like your comment to be an iTunes comment of the week, just leave us an iTunes comment and click five stars and um, tell all your friends and have them tell all their friends. And then pretty soon, everyone in the whole world will be listening and will be leaving comments. And if you want to email the show, it's A-R-I-Y-M-B-F at AllisonRosen.com. And I've been saying that if, you buy, uh, if you're going to buy something on Amazon, click through the banner on my website. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and it helps out the show. And if you buy something on Amazon and then email us, we will read your comment on the show, maybe, or if you tweet us. Um, and I'm springing this on Gary. There's nothing that is jumping out to you, is there, about that? I know that I've seen some stuff go by, but, um, but still, the one that really stands out to me the most is the one where the guy wrote us to tell us that he bought some condoms through the site, and he thinks of me every time he's having sex with his wife, and having sex is not the way he put it. Anyway, um, I need to tell you guys about some of our fine sponsors, scorebig.com. This is like Priceline for tickets to all sorts of events, sporting events, concerts, musicals, Broadway, all that kind of stuff. Um, You know how you go and you try to buy a ticket and then you hear that it's sold out and you're like, oh, God damn it. And then you just know, you just know that there are tickets available 
but you were told that it was sold out and you couldn't get them, but you just know that there are tickets available and you know how you get them with scorebig.com. They have those tickets and you can set your own price. You tell them how much you want to pay and if they can do it, then you get the tickets. There's no extra fees. There's, it's not like those other sites that you go to when you're trying to, de- when you're desperately trying to go to an event that you really want to see, um, where you buy tickets and then all of a sudden it turns out to be a lot more than you thought. Like what you enter as what you're going to pay is exactly what you pay. Yeah, and all their tickets are guaranteed to be at least 10% off face. So, you know, you're never going to end up paying more than the ticket was worth, but you'll oftentimes get a much better deal than even 10%. And, uh, yeah, Allison's right. There's no fees or anything. So if you say, I want two tickets to go see the Lakers, and you're willing to spend 60 bucks a ticket, then if they can do it, you're walking out with two tickets for exactly $120, including shipping or whatever other method they use to uh, get the tickets to you. It's all included, and uh, it's it's really it's a cool site. I mean, you can you can – bid on tickets at different levels, you know, different quality tickets, you know, if you want to sit closer to the court Mm -hmm. or if you want to sit, you know, a little higher, something like that. So uh, it's it's really cool and it's very intuitive the way it works. You just, you you plug it in and if it works, it works and you get it right there and you're done. So uh, it's a very cool site. And you don't feel shaken down or taken advantage of because tickets can be something where you're like, I really want to go to this, but God, that was an unsavory experience. Um, yeah, and they are adding new events all the time. So if, so if you check for an event and it's not there, keep checking because they're adding it in real time. Go to scorebig.com and enter the code BESTFRIEND at checkout and get an extra $15 off scorebig.com's already low prices for your first order. Tickets on scorebig.com are always below box office price guaranteed. Don't forget to enter Best Friend at checkout and get an extra $15 off scorebig.com's already low prices for your first order. Again, Best Friend, because uh, that's me. I'm Allison Rosen, your new best friend. Okay. Stamps.com. I love these guys. If you have a small business, if you're selling stuff on eBay, if you're doing anything where you're mailing a lot of parcels or letters or various other types of things that you're mailing, you need Stamps.com because you can save precious time by not having to go to the post office, not dealing with that hassle. You can do everything that you can do at the post office from your computer and your printer. You can print out postage, official U.S. postage, right there on your computer. Um, Stamps.com customers receive special discounts on mailing and shipping that you can't even get at the post office. And if you have a small business and you're currently uh, renting or leasing an expensive postage meter, stop. Just use Stamps.com. They give you a scale. Uh, and then you know exactly how much to be putting on your parcels. You need this. We use this here at the shop. It is amazing. Um, and uh, actually, they don't tell you this, but the scale, it's pretty sharp looking. Yeah, and I mean, it's it saves not only time because you avoid all the hassles of the post office, but also money because, I mean, how many times have you sent a package and thought, oh, this is not getting returned to me. I'm, I'm putting on five stamps. And, and it turns out it Every probably time. only needed three and a half. So, Every time. Because yeah. you're like, oh, it's just the price of a few more stamps and it'll save me all the, the hassle. But if you're doing it a lot, it's the price of a lot more stamps. Save money. Save time. Get with the future. Get stamps.com. Um, use my name, Allison, for a special offer. It's a no-risk trial plus a $110 bonus offer. It includes the digital scale and up to $55 of free postage. $55 of free postage. Don't wait. Go to stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Allison. That's stamps.com. Enter Allison. And again, um, they will be checking to see who got to stamps.com via the promo code Allison. So if you like the show and want to help us out and want a great product, Go sign up, won't you? Okay, then. And then also go to meeting by Citrix. Um, we, we love these guys. We go to meeting with them, actually, uh, with Michael, who's in France right now. He's the owner, and he's awesome. Um, so go to meeting. You can now meet with your coworkers. You don't have to haul your buns into the office and sit there face-to-face Instead, you can just meet with them virtually face-to-face on your computer from wherever you are. You could be at a coffee house. You could be at an amusement park. You could be in Jamaica, the island, or Jamaica, Queens. You could be on a boat. You could just be in a hammock. Basically, anywhere where it's inconvenient for you to actually drive to wherever or, or fly, commute to wherever the people are. You don't have to anymore. It's so convenient. You can just video chat with them uh, HD faces, so you see them. It's like crystal clear quality. 
the audio is great, you can collaborate on documents together, and you can do it from your laptop or your desktop computer, but you can also do it from your iPad, uh, and now you can host meetings on the iPad as well, not just participate in them. And it's, it's extremely useful for collaboration. Allison and I were working on the uh, album artwork for the aforementioned uh, live from L.A. Podfest yes. with Greg Proops and Doug Benson. And we were having a lot of back and forth with the changes and just minor things. And we ended up just jumping on GoToMeeting, and then I shared my screen with Allison. And then in real time, she told me what she wanted and got to see me make the changes. And it was a lot easier than going back and so forth much with more. 45 emails over, we'll make this one just a little bit bigger, and let's change the yes. color just a touch. It was so much easier once we got on GoToMeeting. So we really do love this product. It works well. We use it you know, here at the shop mm-hmm. with each other. And it's just it works it works great it's it's super efficient and simple start hosting your own face-to-face online meetings today with go to meeting my listeners that's you guys can try it free for 45 days don't wait for this special offer visit go to meeting click on the try it free button use the promo code allison be sure to use the promo code allison um, and an, a, a very special exciting thing that makes me insanely jealous citrix is uh, sponsoring a contest with the show where we are giving away a new iPad. Giving away a new iPad. Do I even have a new iPad? No, but we're going to give you one. Who was it earlier who I just heard say envy is an ugly emotion? I don't know. It's true, though. I'm filled with envy. But I like Lynch. That's right. But he was talking not about me and this iPad, but I think that he could have been. Honestly, I'm excited for the person who's going to get the iPad that I want. (sighs) Calm down. Anyway. It would be weird if you had an iPad that was autographed by you. I think it'd be great. Yeah, it would just it would it would, uh, you know, it would be a you know, conversation. You know what piece. I'd write? I'd just write hi. <laughs> I don't even need to see my signature. I know what it looks like. But yeah, the iPad that we're going to be giving giving away uh, will be autographed by yours truly, and we're going to throw in some Allison Rosen, who's your new best friend, swag. So that is exciting. Some people say swag, some say swag. Which do you say, Gar? E. Swag. Was that a, a s or sh- S W? Okay. Stuff we all get. That's what that stands for? I don't know. It was in an episode of The Office. It's huh. always stuck with me. I uh, don't. Interesting. Well, then I say stuff we all get, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, here's how you uh, win this iPad. Tell us, if you could host a meeting from anywhere in the world using a GoToMeeting, where would it be and why? I'm going to say that again. If you could host a meeting from anywhere in the world using GoToMeeting, where would it be and why? Tweet your answer to us using the hashtag AllisonFreeiPad. And then we will look these over. And you can tweet that to at Allison Rosen or at ARIYMBF. And then we'll look these over and then we'll choose someone and then we will autograph the stuff and throw in the sh- wag or the swag. We'll, we're going to throw in both. And then... I will be filled with envy, and then my envy will go down a bit, and then it'll pop back up if we, when, when we do this next time. But I'm very happy for you guys. All right. Um, do I have anything else I need to tell them, Gary? I don't? Okay. You guys, Jay Moore is the guest on this episode. Um, we I, – I, that's not the royal we. That's Gary and I. Really enjoyed talking to him. Um, he's great. He's very open. He's really funny. And there's actually, you'll you'll hear it, I don't want to spoil it, but there's a part in the episode where he um, is is recounting a story. You know know what? I've said too much already. Uh, 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 How awkward this is. No, I I can't say it. It's going to step on it. Anyway, now you have to listen. Um, Oh, and don't forget, as I said earlier, check the iTunes, check iTunes for the LA Pod Fest show. Um, but again, if you're following me on Twitter at Allison Rosen or at ARIYNBF, which you should be following both, uh, then we'll let you know uh, when that goes up. Okay, I love you guys. Here's the episode. Thank you for listening to this super long uh, intro. Bye. Allison Rosen, Allison Rosen is your new best friend. Allison, Allison. Friend. 
Hey, everyone. Hi. Hello. It's me, Allison Rosen. Welcome to another episode, another exciting episode. It's exciting of Allison Rosen as your new best friend. My guest today is Jay Moore. Hello, Jay. Hello, Allison. Before the show started, we were talking about some pretty fascinating stuff. And then yeah. Gary's like, wait, we got to get this on air. We were talking about elephants and how the size of their <laughs> or the shape of their ears determines where they're from. And then I was thinking, I've heard a similar thing about camels, not the shape, but like one hump or two hump is what kind of camel they are. I only know from the book Everybody Poops mm-hmm. that a one hump camel makes a one hump poop and a two hump camel makes a two hump poop. Then you turn the page. Only kidding. Oh. That's what it says. I was pretty it. excited about that for a second. I, yeah, it'd be pretty neat. But I think a humped poop would hurt a lot. That's like a Vicodin poop. When you too much Vicodin, you have a humped poop. Well, wait a minute. Are your poops never humped? I don't have any humps. I have lady lumps. My humps, my humps, my humps. <laughs> I have Fergie poops. Well, that leads right into the other note I jotted down. You were saying that you like salt. You don't like sugar. I like sugar, but I'm like kind of crazy about salt. Like you guys have a great pretzel display. Mm-hmm. I'm the guy. All right. When you buy that big jug of pretzels, like that uh, plastic circle, looks like a barrel, like a miniature yeah, barrel. That's what that's what's here. I think it's from Costco. I'm the guy licking my finger in my home. I don't do it like here yeah. at your studio, at your you know show. But I'll lick my finger <laughs> and I'll just go to the bottom and just I'll just come up with my finger complete like shake and bake chicken. It just mm-hmm. looks it's just covered in salt. Like but, that makes me happy. The funny thing about that is that as you were sort of pantomiming that, you were swiveling your hips, your humps, if you will. My humps, my humps, my <laughs> – hey, girl. You know, I never you had – You very sassy as you were licking the salt. I have sass. And I have – in spades. You, you got to red recognize my sass. <laughs> I never uh, ate salt because I wrestled and we never had like sugar or salt. Like it was always like – Chicken breast and fish and like completely plain spinach. Are you talking about the family you grew up in or meals that were prepared other wrestlers, with your wrestling my, Myself buddies? and other wrestlers that my, – and then meals that were prepared to accommodate, you know, not missing weight. Mm-hmm. So then like at 34, I discovered salt and it was like, oh my god, a steak and with salt on it is a mi- – take your A1 sauce and shove it up your ass, waiter. Why would I put <laughs> sauce on this when there's salt? Yeah. Now I know why wars were fought over it. I realize – I have to say this real quick. You and I have the two worst uh, podcast and acronyms ever. Yeah, mine's A-R-I-Y-N-B-F. A-R-I-Y-N-B-F. And then mine's multiple sclerosis. Yeah. And people- Join me on MS. <laughs> uh, people all the time are like, is, does that, that looks like Aryan Boyfriend. It is. It. That's what you should just you should just say. Join, joining me next on Aryan Boyfriend. I know. That would be a whole – I feel like that – would just be a whole different type of show. Well, it doesn't have to be. It's a mislead. It's a bait and switch. Right. And are you going to say joining me next on multiple sclerosis? I will if you do. I, I you know what? Then we both. I, I don't want to. But mine's a disease. I don't want to say the disease. Kenahura. Pa pa pa. Right. Mine's just a lifestyle choice. Yeah. <laughs> I, if mine was a life like if MS was like a lifestyle choice, like if I chose it, then I would say it. So I'm going to say let's both. Well, don't you think Arianism chooses you? Oh, yeah. I mean, it chose me. <laughs> Hence, that's why I wear these sleeves so people don't see peckerwood running across my forearms. Right. Do you have any tattoos? I have a lot of tattoos. And where where I have are wife, they? My wife, my life, on my wrists, and her handwriting, mm-hmm. stars, me, her, and the baby. I have a giraffe on my arm. Stick your neck off what you believe in. Does it say that? or does No, it just, it's just my grandfather used to that. collect... Uh, my father's father was president of Revlon in the 50s, Jack Moore. He was a band leader, Jack Moore in the hi-hats. He ran for Senate, lost, but he ran. He was in the game, and he was like a fancy guy. And um, he, he, uh, everybody always gave him giraffes as get like, to- not giraffes, the animal. Like, here's your giraffe, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> That's my giraffe noise. <laughs> That's really convincing and good. <laughs> <laughs> Is there really, a giraffe in here? I have no idea what they look like. Maybe a little like Jamie Foxx. Looks a little like a giraffe to me. Yes. Oddly. Something about the eyelashes. Yeah. Eyelashes, elevated buttock. Mm-hmm. A certain carriage that and suggests s- giraffe. Yeah. And a 16-inch long tongue. <laughs> and vertebrae the size of a car battery. Yeah. So uh, he always was given giraffes as gifts, like wooden giraffes and you know pillows and stuff. So I remember as a kid, 
there was this whole atrium of his house in Montclair, New Jersey that overlooked the Manhattan skyline. It was just filled with like plants and giraffes from like Ray Boulder, Jane Mansfield and John Wayne. Like everybody gave Jack Moore like if you meet him, bring him a giraffe. Mm -hmm. So then when he was on his deathbed, he was riddled with dementia. And then my MTV half hour comedy hour aired and he just we watched it in his uh, hospital bed. And then he just had was completely lucid and said, you really seem like you're the captain of your own ship, J.J. Now, listen, you know why I collect giraffes? I said, no, Pop Pop. He goes, a giraffe is the real king of the jungle. Everyone says it's the lion, but it's not. A giraffe's kick will disembowel a lion, but they never kick each other. Be the first to see trouble. Stick your neck up for what you believe in. Never be afraid to wade out and get the high-hanging fruit. Um and then he just like went back into dementia. So then when he died, I got the draft tattoo. That's really sad and also beautiful. Yeah, I don't think it's sad at all. Bring, come okay. with me to that's the really, come that's with inspiring. me. Come with me to the uplift. All right, right I'll here. see. <laughs> Is that your baby? Yeah, he brought baby Meredith. Baby Meredith did a not boy enjoy named the giraffe, giraffe story. No, he hated the giraffe story. Yeah. If the mics picked that, that up, that's kind of funny. Not another giraffe story. <laughs> So, yeah, no, you wanted to talk about my priest. Yes, I did. But wait, I want to first let's talk about a boy named Meredith. Yeah, uh, his grandfather's name is Meredith, mm-hmm. who was named after Meredith Wilson, who wrote The Music Man, who and uh, M- Big Meredith's mother, Granny, is a music teacher. Mm-hmm. So Meredith Wilson is like, the you know, it's Meredith Wilson. So I'm going to name my son after Meredith Wilson. And then I realized I'll name my son over the kindest man I've ever met, and that's Nick's dad, Meredith Cox, my hero, my now hero. Well, there you go. My other hero died. Who's my, your other hero? My my mother's father, Red, was my all-time just unbelievably great. Jersey Shore had a boat. Let's go out and fish, just me and you, like kind of what you need when you're a comic actor child and you don't mm-hmm. know what the hell's going on. You're like, am I gay or am I going into show business? Because I don't fit in anywhere. <laughs> and then all of a sudden Red goes, let's just go out on the boat. It's, I've got to go into the ocean to get gas. And you're like, oh, yeah, let's do it. And you have jobs and you can help. And he teaches you how to like dock a boat and you're 10. And it just feels important and great. And then, um, all right, I'll tell you, this is, I met Nick's dad about four months. I'm not sure of the time. And my son, I was always very aggressive. I still am way too aggressive than I ever would like to be. And I I pray all the time to just not interrupt so much and be kinder and gentler and nicer. And I'm very very knee-jerk response in the negative. Like, Mm -hmm. eh. And I remember my oldest boy, Jackie, was making me a little nuts one particular day. And I just sat down and I prayed for patience. I literally just like took a time out, sat on my couch and begged God to show me patience, and Nick's father rang my doorbell. So I prayed for patience, and he rang my doorbell. And then my son would you know, say, count to five, and he'd go, one, 11, lefty, <laughs> two, and Nick's dad would go, that's right. And I just spent months going, no, one, how are you not getting this? One, mm-hmm. two, three, you know. And like, what's your name? Glop. that's right, you got it, buddy. So um, he's taught me more how to be a father through example than I, uh, I, I when people say like I didn't know I had that in me like you hear I guess it's more of like a sports analogy like I didn't know I had that kind of you know mm-hmm. stuff in me I didn't know that I could be I could settle into a calm parenting uh, patience uh, Nick's dad Meredith my hero actually is the one that just showed me through example. Never, ever told me how to do anything. You just watch him laying on the ground with your kid and you go, I want to be like that. What was your dad like? Uh, cold. Not He loves me very much, but not an I love you guy. Just sort of dry, aloof. Doesn't really have any interests. It's just, I still not sure. I guess a lot like Adams mm-hmm. from what, what we've talked about. Yeah. And just... You know, it's either NASCAR or like Rutgers football are the two things you call, talk to my dad about, and then he'll just go, yeah, yeah. Just like, oh. Quite a connection, yeah. And now with Nick's dad, there's like this guy that comes over to the house to play with his grandson, and he goes, I think you'll think this book is fascinating. 
it's really fascinating. And I'll read – and like then I'm in this race to finish the book by the time he comes over again because now there's somebody that's like going, hey, here's something that mm-hmm. we might share an interest. And I, I don't want to let him down. Like I right. want to be a good student and hand it in. So I saw him today and I was able to show him both books and go, you were right. They were great. Mm-hmm. Um, so you were saying that you're sort of – maybe default setting or something you struggle with is just being reactive in the negative sense. Um, I am someone who maybe I'll react inside negatively, but something that I feel like I need to improve on is that it just, it takes me a really long time to react in a heated moment appropriately because I, like, I just always feel like I'm a little bit too, I'm processing too slowly for what's happening. Like, you know, the person will walk away and I'll be like, I think what happened was fucked up, but I need to think about it more and then figure out how I feel. And, like, it makes having an organic reaction to something fucked up at the time impossible because I'm just like, what? Like, I don't know. I'm always afraid that I'm interpreting things wrong or I I never want to be – I never want to be lashing out in, in like, an untoward way. It sounds like you are kind of the opposite, though. What happens to you? So you think of the perfect response later that night laying in bed and you're like, oh, my God, I could have buried that person if I just said blank. It's not even so much burying that person because or got I'm my not point even across sure. perfectly. Yeah, I'm not even. It takes me a while to adjust to the fact that that was an antagonistic interaction. I'm always trying to justify that person's behavior so that it's not like that someone was a jerk. I think that's healthy. I think that's a healthy thing to do because it, you're processing. It's very Buddhist of you. I, I, sometimes like, I see is, it as naive, but. Well, uh, it could be, but it keeps you – you're the one not arguing with anybody. Yeah. So, I mean, you've saved yourself many an argument just by sitting back and going – I mean, if the Buddhists think that, you know, or the Toltec Indians, like that book, The Four Agreements, mm-hmm. like everyone has their own separate dream and this person, what they're saying to me is just based on their dream, their assumptions and all their things. You're actually processing the, all that before you respond. Mm, well, that's a very generous way of looking at it. But for you, what happens? I, I think react. I said it – I don't – my knee-jerk response in, as I'm walking through life isn't negative. I'm a annoying optimist. Like, let's go do it. Why wouldn't it work? Like, mm-hmm. you, why would we ever get a flat tire? This is great. Let's do it. I think my default uh, and therefore fault is I'm way too aggressive. I'm like fired up guy. I get all, I get like manic and I think when you're new to a situation – it's not up to someone to like quote unquote get you. So I I came up with like East Coast comics like New Jersey, Staten Island, like and all we did is kill each other. Like Jim Norton, Patrice O'Neill, Rich Voss, Colin Quinn. We just destroyed each other. Excuse me. Nonstop. Just destroyed each other. And then, you know, when you come out to LA and you do like a few movies and you show up at the Laugh Factory and you're like, wow, look at these five assholes. Like those people, <laughs> those five people all of a sudden go, what just happened? Because that guy that does movies came in and just called us all assholes. And to me, it's like, no, we're like brothers in comedy. This is how it works where I'm from. And it took me a long time to realize that's not how it works. People don't like you to say, to bust their balls. These. Yeah. And when I met my wife, she said uh, early on, oh, let's get something straight. Uh, never tease me, never tickle me, never frighten me. And I went, done. Like I never had somebody just say like, these are yeah. the three things that will is- ensure my exit. And I said, that's easy. Oh, that's so, that's so wise and good that she knew what they were and that she could lay it out like that. And she probably also knew, because she's far smarter than I am, she probably knew what my th- – things were right what was it never tease me never tickle me what was the third frighten me frighten me uh, like boo like yeah. don't hide around a corner and scare me that's that's no way that's no way to keep it going mm-hmm. so or this gal yeah you know how did you guys meet uh we met on the set of las vegas i you know it's funny i was offered to be a guest star in las vegas three times and all three times i turned it down because i was like star that stars mr humps that's right. Mr. Humps is indeed. <laughs> no one knows what it means. It's provocative. He, uh, he's a very sweet boy, by the way. He's Josh. an attractive man as well. He's attractive, but he, he, that's probably the least of his qualities. He's a super kind guy. He's very sweet. Uh, we're speaking, of course, of Jimmy Kahn, who's married to uh, Fergie. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what? It, it's not even like it doesn't even not make sense. Jimmy Conn and Fergie hooking up in this day and age. It does make sense. Uh, I, I was offered Las Vegas guest spots three times, and I turned all three times down. And then I had heard. Uh, then the third time, and John Lovitz took two of them. The guy that can't lose, and they got to mm-hmm. get him out of the casino. And John Lovitz, ah, I can't stop winning. It's terrific. <laughs> And there was another one where the guy was like an assassin or something. Did it make you feel weird that that's who they got for a role that they wanted you for? No, because he did it well. Anytime you see it and you go, well, he, you know what? It's funny. Like, it's great because there's no, you know, there's been, there's been parts you don't get and you're like, you're super baffled as to how do they choose that? Like, what? Yeah. Like, oh, we're so alike, me and Eric Stone Street. Of course you chose him. <laughs> but he's actually really good. So even that is a bad example because he's a really good actor. Um. But a lot of times, like, you know, somebody, you know, whatever. I, I've tried to, I can't think off the top of my head, but I want to stick to your question, and I apologize. I'm a rambler. I'm a rambling man. It's all right. So the third time I was offered the guest spot on Las Vegas, I was mulling it over. I was kind of doing movies still. And then <laughs> Barry Katz, my manager, called me and goes, you know, Nikki Cox is single. Well, that helps sway your uh, opinion. <laughs> And I go, but I thought she was, uh, you know, uh, with somebody. And he goes, no, nah, man, because Barry was managing her boyfriend, fiance at the time. He goes, no, nah, man, they broke up. And then I was like, oh, yeah, book me on the show. I want to meet her. Had you expressed an interest before that or did he just know your type? Uh, no, I never had a type. I just didn't. I, I never really thought much about anything ever in my life. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I don't really think she's a type, really, because she's right. an anomaly. Well, I guess my question then is, it's had like being you... married to a gay twink, like she's the libido of like a fifteen-year-old boy, like I'm the old woman. Like, come on, let's cuddle. <laughs> what do you mean, quick? <laughs> well, we were on the road, and I said, "Do you want to have sex?" And she goes, "Can you make it quick?" And I, was, I just started giggling, like. <laughs> Just so hysterical. <laughs> like the room service guy's coming. Can you do it before the room service guy comes? Like, I'll do my best. It, well, how'd it go? Quickly. Um, no, my question was the fact that Barry Katz knew that that would sway you. Like, had you expressed an interest in her to him before? Or did he I just... must have. Yes. I. You know what? In hindsight, I definitely had always. She's. I think she's always been on many people's short list of you know, people in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. And when the conversation comes around to people that are acting now, you know, the name, you go, Nikki Cox on Las Vegas. But uh, they had broken up, I think it was six weeks, eight weeks, six weeks. Was it Bobcat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had broken up and then we met. And uh, I remember we just, I started, I'm so used to just staring I guess for lack of a better expression. <laughs> and I just quoted like one sentence from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And like she just said the next sentence back to me, like paging Mr. Herman. <laughs> and she had like the dead face that Pee Wee had. And like her eyes went back. And it was like, and action. And I think I forgot my lines. So I'm like, they make women like this? <laughs> this hot, this funny, this smart, this gets me somehow? So she always says that she felt like she knew me right away. Like she already knew who I mm-hmm. was the whole time. And people always ask me, was it love at first sight? And I always say it was kind of – that doesn't really do it justice. It was everything at first sight. Like, and I was willing – if she, if we were just going to be friends and she was going to tell me about the guy, she complained like at 2 in the morning like, guess what he did? Mm-hmm. I was even willing to be that guy because I had to you have her. on board, yeah. I had to just have this magical person around me. She was hysterical. She's super hot and she's Funny and she's smarter than me by a million miles, and she, she everything, all the pie wedges I lacked, she had like, you know, uh, you know, literature and art and like great like erudite stuff. Like, ooh, who's Cy Twombly? What's Anne Sexton? What is this new stuff? So, yeah, I was even willing to just be the friend. Like, where guys are like, she's playing you, man. Mm-hmm. I was like, good, play away, because I get to talk to her and laugh. Was there a period of time where you guys were just friends? No, it was it was pretty immediate. It was uh, I asked her out that day. My character asked her to marry him that day, and she said no. Fortunately, a year after that, she said yes. <laughs> uh, 
I asked her if she wanted to go out. She'll have a much better recollection of this uh, because she's just smarter and better at remembering things. But I, I remember I asked her out, and uh, but what she agreed. I do remember this. She agreed to it, but that that one percent of ambiguity of are we going out to like hang out? Mm-hmm. Are we going out because I don't drink? Like, am I just going to sit you sit and watch you like drink champagne someplace? And so I had to say to her, I remember I said, so this is like a date. Like you and I are going on a – this is between a date, date. Like we're going on a date. And she goes, yes, because I like to categorize and file every part of my social (laughs) calendar. You and I are going on a date. I said, okay, great. (laughs) And then I remember I called. I got her phone number. You'll like this. She finished before me that day at work. And then I finished. It was dark out. It was late, like I don't know, 830 or so. And there was a fake mustache in my trailer with a, just a piece of paper. And the note simply said, I think you might need this with the letter N. <laughs> and I'm like, who? This is like the coolest. Like this is like spy, like little kid. Yeah. Like let's make a fort stuff. Like that's where it tugged at me mm-hmm. too. As, I mean obviously incredible amounts of lust. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it tugged somewhere else too. It tugged a lot. Uh, so – and I remember I called her that night and I said, where are you? And she was at her parents because uh, she no longer had a home after she was mm-hmm. uh, broken up with. So she was living at her parents out of everything she put in a duffel bag. So it had been about six weeks and she was just living at her mom's house, like literally being fed by her mom because she couldn't like stand up. She was kind of broken. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, well, where do your parents live? And she's like, you know, Santa Monica. I'm like, well, like where in Santa Monica? Like what's the house number of your parents? I'm like, because I could come right now. And I, I, I went – like nothing was left to chance. I mm-hmm. could not possibly let another man shake her hand at this point. It's like I had to just cl- – not close the deal because that's too like, what's up, bro? Right. She closed the deal. But I just had to be with her and near her. Uh, and that night, I believe it was that night, we went on a date and we. she took me to uh, the nativity scenes they put on Ocean Boulevard in mm-hmm. Santa Monica where each – it was just so amazingly hilarious and perfect where they dress up with mannequins and they look like Will Ferrell in like beard <laughs> sketches. Like, this is Joseph and the angel comes and speaks to Mary and you're like, look at that creepy Jesus baby. It's just a mannequin baby in like a diaper. Mm. <laughs> And then we went to Swinger's Restaurant in Santa Monica. And for some reason, in front of her, I hit on the waitress. Why? I don't know why. There's so much judgment in my voice. Let me, let me change that. No, there should be. Why? It's it's reprehensible. It's, it, why? But it, but it wasn't like, hey, it, I don't know. why. I think it was just I, – I, I did so many things in the beginning of the relationship there that can't be explained away, that are so bizarre for words. But I, I remember – in some of my earlier dating days, being on a date with someone that I liked and then talking about an ex or talking about another guy, which was really stupid, but almost just to sort of display, like, I'm not that into you. Like, almost an emotional safety thing. Do you think it was something like that? Or was it just... I think that would be an easy knob to hang the coat on, but I don't... I'm not sure if... I think I just was like just bad shit. I was just weird. Mm. I just had no I was completely directionless. I was unhappy uh for like a decade before we met. I was just awfully unhappy. Why? Well, I was in another relation a wrong. I was with the wrong person and I stretched it out like cuz that's what you do. And, mm-hmm. But I knew you know, there's a Springsteen lyric, God have mercy on the man who doubts what he's sure of, and I knew from the moment I was with this person. It wasn't it. But then the other person starts going like, well, what about, you know, engagement? What about marriage? And then you do it and then you have a child. And then all of a sudden you realize this is horrible. And I knew walking down the aisle it wasn't the right thing. But I I thought that's what you do. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's not what you do. So my advice to anybody listening is the advice my wife told our nine-year-old, her stepson, my son, Jackie, meet your best friend that you want to kiss and then marry them. <laughs> so how? So you knew from the get-go with your relationship before this that it was wrong? Yes. I always said— Because wasn't she—like you were with her way back when, right? 
Yeah, I I met her, and then three days later I got Saturday Night Live, and then I didn't see her for six months. And just kind of, but like when I went to Saturday Night Live, there was no, no, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, staying faithful or any? It, it's just it, it, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. There's it was just uh, you know I'm over here, you're over there. I'm on SNL. I've known you three days, but some and it was just back and forth. I was never, I think we were apart way more than we were together because mm-hmm. I was on the road a lot. And we argued incessantly about nothing and everything and everything in between. And I always say like when you see those clearance signs, when you go through a, a, an overpass, it'll say like 14 feet. Mm-hmm. It was always 14 feet and one eighth of an inch. <laughs> just always argh, taking a layer off. Yeah. It was terrible. I mean, it was just absolutely terrible. And that I can honestly say with Nick, when I married her, I was married, and I swear to God this is true. I married, when I married Nick, I married the first woman I was ever in love with. I'd never been in love prior to her. Did you think you were in love, though, before? Oh, no, I knew I was not. I just thought that, it was like a 50s mentality. Like, I just thought that's what you do. Even before you had a child together, you felt like you have to see it through? Yeah, like you, you think a child's going to fix it. You uh, always think something's going to fix it. You always think, oh, you know what? I'll just go on the road for three weeks, mm-hmm. and then that'll make everything great. But that's – we've been – Nick and I have been apart, I think, 15, 16 days in eight years. And I would say a week of that was um, her sleeping over in the hospital to care for her special aunt. When she broke her feet, she broke her ankles, and so she needed twenty four hour care, but you can't have nurses don't like things thrown at them mm-hmm. and uh she has a special aunt who's you know, a grown up you know she's like fifty so and when she gets mad and starts throwing stuff and including fists, <laughs> most nurses tap out, so then right. Nick would just go and sleep over in the hospital uh. um. Sorry, just one more question about the. Oh, I don't the, care about okay. it. Okay, it's I'm having fun. Um, you're good, dude. Hey, it's A R I Y N B F. I mean, what could go wrong? That's right. <laughs> um, and I know we share the same philosophy about you know the white race. Yeah. So white um, is right. <laughs> Down uh, with brown, but black is whack. Yeah. Well, that's safe to say because no one's black. Well, not in this room. No. But you, I don't think anyone's ever actually been the color black. Oh yeah, I don't. I think you're right. Yeah, I know. Half, actually, one of those gigolo to... guys, half of his body's black with tattoos. <laughs> the one guy, the left side's got like. You ever see that show, Gigolos? Mm-mm. Alice and Rose, and how can you be my new best friend if you haven't seen Gigolos? Uh, whatever it takes to be your new best friend, I'll do it. Gary, Gigolos. G- Gary, have you seen it? Oh well, Gary. Gary but he's it. not even I, in contention not. for best friend. Gary, status. they show like these gigolo guys. They go, uh, you know, meet these gals that hire them, and then then they like, you know, you're getting old and square when you're like, oh, I don't want to see these people have sex. I like when they're back <laughs> playing volleyball, busting each other's chops, and comp- like, where's the money going to come from yeah. if there's two black clients? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to choose? Because, yeah, it's a whole thing. Gigolos is great. I think you'll get obsessed with it. Where will I find it? Showtime. Okay. I have Showtime currently. You should you have like 11. Go. There's like 11 Showtimes. Showtime have, Deporte. I do. Yeah, I know. Showtime East, on Espanol. West, Extreme. Showtime Mormon Showtime. I have them all. Diet Showtime. Diet Showtime Light. Keep them coming. Showtime Zero. Showtime. Oh, uh, I saw the eyes. You right. gave it away. That's right. Um, Showtime One. There is that. Isn't there? No. I don't know. I feel like there should be. There's always weird things where it's like Showtime S L N, and you're like, "All right, dude, just what's yeah. playing?" Right. You could just say Showtime the whole way through. I guess one or through show. ten. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I actually don't have a specific question. For some reason, I'm. I'm. I feel like I want to know more about this first marriage that you knew was wrong for the whole time, but you stuck it out. But I don't have a specific question, so that leads well, it's us easy nowhere. to stick it out when you're not there. Okay. You know what I mean. But if like was here here's my question basically. You knew that it wasn't right. You knew that it wasn't really love. Did you know that there was some other way to have a relationship and there was probably someone else out there for you or did some Oh part- yeah. And really? I and I sought it out often. Oh okay. <laughs> gotcha. So you so so there was no fidelity during Saturday night night live or after. I have no comment. Okay. 
I have a child. Children. With that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, However, I will say it's amazing. I do think there's – I know just because I meet them and talk to them and hang out with them. There is just this incredible new population of guys that just kind of want to hang out with their wives. And when you tell me like, hey, we're going out to like the strip club, I like – I got nothing. Like, all right, mm-hmm. I'm going to go to the hotel and go up to my room and watch Law and Order. Like, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know this life. Yeah. I don't know how you could do this life. Well, I think – you know, I think about those kind of things often. Um, I think in this day and age for – at least for me and for a lot of people I know, there's not this incredible pressure – to get married young, have kids young, pair off. So I think it means that people who do that, it's because you want to be with the person. Like I just moved in with my boyfriend. But before I spent – and I'm, I'm really liking it so far. But for a long time beforehand, I was thinking like how do you know when is the right time to move in with the person? Because you can't be away from them. Because when you're not with them, you're wondering how long right. till I'm over there. But I – but I think in. But you better tell him I don't like to be teased. I don't like to be tickled. And I don't <laughs> well, like there to be was frightened. what I told Unless him you is. Unless you like to be tickled. Yeah, no, I. That's not a deal breaker for me, but I don't relish it. I don't like noogies though. But what I did put tell him. Put your foot him, down early. I, well, I put my foot down on the he imitated the way I said something, one time. That's that's mocking. That's yeah, teasing. and and right, and I, no I said I think that's really mean or something like that, and like yeah. that. So that that is where I do the line. What's his? Can we say his name? Yeah, his name's Daniel. Daniel, no teasing. That's right. Okay. Uh, but I think in like my parents' time, there wouldn't have been that question of when do we move in. It's when I want to be with the person. It was like just you just sort of get on this track, and you. Well, I mean, my parents are still together and and they're in love, so maybe they're not the right example. But I think that a lot of people, you just it's just what you do. Well, you would get married and then you'd move in. You know, and you yeah. just—it's not so much about what's right for me, what's right for my in my life. It's like, I mean, especially g- past generations of women, it was well, you get married so you have someone to take care of you and take care of the kid, and you that's know. why I married Nick. I need somebody to take care of me. Yeah, I need to be managed and mothered. <laughs> I'm I know you're joking. <laughs> yes, uh, but you know, it's that line from Harry Met Sally: when you want to spend the rest of your life with somebody, you want the rest of your life to start right away. Mm-hmm. So that, I love that movie too. It's a great movie. It's perfect. It's a perfect movie. Yeah. Rob Reiner doesn't get credit for putting together perfect movies like that old game of what director put together the greatest three movies in a row. Mm-hmm. Like Lume, like Rob Reiner's up there, and you know, there's. Rob Reiner's way, I think he's very underrated. Mm -hmm. I do too. And different genres, completely different genres. Right. You know, like just completely different movies from time to time. Like schizophrenia, like. Um, On, I was listening to your podcast with Brody Stevens. Go on. (laughs) (laughs) That was a good Uh, one. And yeah, it was. But you said something early on that was uh, disparaging about your interviewing skills. I'm a much better I'm much better having a conversation than interviewing cuz I'm a horrible interrupter. Uh, see, I think you I think you're you're good at both. Um but I just wanted to know what your thoughts are about that. So you think it's cuz you interrupt? I know it is. I interrupt a lot um and then the problem is when you show an audience how much you interrupt and they're aware of it and you are aware of it. Mm-hmm. Then there's times like with the Ray Boom Boom Mancini interview, I had to interrupt him. Otherwise, we would have been talking about his amateur career for an hour and a half. Because boxers <laughs> That's what remember, the fans want. Boxers remember everything. And this is a guy that killed someone in the ring. So I had to keep interrupting Ray to steer him towards the Duck Who Kim fight. Mm-hmm. And people were like, why do you let him finish his sentence? I'm like, because I don't care about Norman LaGrange in Oklahoma where he outpointed a guy when he had to cut weight when he was 16. Like we're, he – there's bigger things that, like Caesar's Palace kind of built the stadium for Ray Mancini. It's kind of, I need to humanize mm-hmm. Daku Kim and get Ray to speak about that fight almost round for round. Mm-hmm. And what's amazing, that I was really happy with the way it came out because it was very tender and it wasn't. And I even said to the viewers, listeners rather, uh, 
no viewers yet. Yet. I even said to the listeners, like, this is a boxer, but hang in there because it's more about the human condition and the human heart. I don't want you guys to tap out because it's a boxing podcast because it's not. This is a guy whose brother died, and he always jumped into his brother's arms after a win. Now suddenly he wins a title, and I said, well, who, whose arms do you jump into, you know? And his manager or his trainer had another fighter that killed someone in the ring. So the odds of that are zero, yeah. zero. Um, and Ray cried. It was very tender and sad. It's, it, it's still such a raw thing to him 30 years later. Um, it's right there in the surface where it pains him still that this great fighter died. And it wasn't, there was no, um, nothing was, uh, was, shoot, there was no rules broken. It was just the way it went. The guy had head trauma and died. Like they, you punch each other in the face for a long time. Eventually some people die. But when he cried on the podcast was, and I had to interrupt a lot to get to this part mm-hmm. Upstairs, you're in your hotel room after the fight, and he goes on and on. And he goes, yeah, I was laying there. We're having a party. Everybody from Youngstown, Ohio was there, and my mother my mother was icing my hands. Sorry. And we all just got super – that got him. Yeah. And I, and I think it was a combination of – it was just the, the humanity, like the, the, the visceral, that tenderness, these, these fists that just killed someone. My mother – who makes me feel well. Yeah. Mama, on your deathbed, nobody says daddy on their deathbed. Mm-mm. This woman's icing my hands. And he'd give anything just to see her. And his sister was, you know, touching his face and making over him. And that just broke him down. That That's what got him. Um, so I stand by that. I stand by the interrupting and <laughs> in the Ray Mancini interview, but I do tend to, um, I guess, verbally bully and steer when it's not needed um i think you're being hard on yourself i think you you seem like a pretty adept interviewer thank you but you have to understand in my mind i'm saying don't say anything let them finish don't say anything let them finish don't say anything let them finish and i almost have like this add where if somebody says like in this day and age i immediately have to do like pesci like if (laughs) you brought in this day and age i can go immediately (laughs) to pesci or like there's just some Ellipse, like there's so many, there's thousands of ellipses in my mind that are immediately met with like a movie quote or something stupid. So that's, but once I've gotten rid of a lot of those, it's helped. Mm -hmm. I'm getting better, certainly. When you head into an interview with someone, um, are you, are there certain things you know that you want to try to achieve with that interview? I don't know if I've ever really had an interview. Uh, Ray, I wanted him to, I really think it's more of a conversation because I, I think I'm terrible and I think it's very transparent that I'm trying to do an interview when I do an interview. So I try to sit and just talk like how you and I are talking. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like this is an interview, but I guess you would call it an interview, right? Um, I, I feel like what I do is sort of a combination of interview and conversation. Yeah. So I, I don't define it as one or the other, but, but I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah I mean, bull- it's an interview. I'll make bullet points and write down things that I've, I'm like, wait a minute, like you were in an acapella group in college. Like, how does this happen? Mm -hmm. You know, things like that I want to know about. Right. And how are all these alternative comics taking a check from Nickelodeon and Nick Jr. and Disney? So I'll I'll make bullet points about things I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And with Ray Mancini, I'll just use that as an example because that was most like an interview of any of my podcasts was – I needed to know. I think one of his fights were fixed, and I wanted to know if he thought so too. So I said, who have you lost to? Now, me and my friends think one of those fights were fixed. And he goes, oh, yeah, Camacho, no doubt. Like, he just came out and said it, which was like, oh, my God, this is great. But like Brody, for example, we just talked. And then sort of, you know, the Lennon quote of life's what what happens when you're busy making other plans. Like, Mm -hmm. this organic, complete, great discussion about the mental health field and Depression and being bipolar and panic disorder and, and, and crippling depression and stuff like that really just came out. And that was not planned. Gary Goldman and I had a conversation where we just almost kind of cried several times about our dads and feeling cheated. Like, mm-hmm. why won't these guys just call us and tell us they love us? And then, you know, of course, on Twitter, people will touch you up and go, what was that fag fest you and Goldman had? You wait or not? You know how they are. Yeah, I sure do. Those white people, <laughs> your Aryan friends, <laughs> my followers. Um, 
uh, for you get it a lot incredibly dense i'd like to point out i'm not truly aryan you're jewish right you're the opposite yeah yeah we're not the opposite because you're white right but i read your comments oh yeah and it's just it's just unbelievable it's amazing that anybody would take the time to leave a comment of such scorn for me or for you or for anybody it's really bizarre yeah so really, do you right mean now, on iTunes or do you mean on, on Twitter? iTunes? Yeah, and Twitter I always read because sometimes someone will have a legitimate question, and plus, you know, it's the car accident on the side of the road. I don't know why we look, but we have to look. Ugh, if it I wasn't for that's... Twitter, neither one of us would have any idea how much we suck. I know. It doesn't that sometimes seem like what a better way to be? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, but Not I some can't of the time. do it. I can't. I can't bring myself to cut myself off from that uh, stream of shit. I did a show for BlizzCon. I hosted BlizzCon at the Anaheim Convention Center. 6,000 people, like 18 countries. It's crazy. All the World of Warcraft gamers and stuff. I host it. I get done. I had a standing ovation. I walked across the street to the Anaheim Hilton where I was staying and got on my computer and went on Twitter (laughs) to see how I did. I was just there. Yeah. They stood. And then according to Twitter, you would have thought, you know, I, I committed pedophilia and everyone thinks everyone always thinks i'm drunk or high yeah and i'm always like yeah i'm kind of nervous that's why my hands are shaking there's six thousand nerds <laughs> in the audience and i gotta figure out a way how to take my act and formulate it into this sort of Frostmore bits now does all the negativity on twitter erase what was a positive gary's laughing <laughs> no no but I, but it's a Twitter's a learning experience. Like it's, it's really like learning a language. You have to learn to not answer and say, "Well, yeah. what would you have done differently, man?" Yeah. Like just leave it alone. And if somebody says, "Hey, are you coming to Boston?" and you go, "Yeah, you know what? November second, I'm at the Wilbur Theater. I will be in Boston." Then that's something that helps you and mm-hmm. that person. You just touch them up a little, and they're like, "Oh my God, he answered my my." Tweet. I mean, granted, you're getting something out of it, hopefully, and that's a ticket sold. Mm-hmm. And I am at Will and Wilmer. You can say the date. Jmore.com. Just throw all there. You know what is uh, bouncing around my head and preventing me from entirely. Oh. Well, yes, that's in there. Preventing me from fully being invested in the Twitter conversation is the fact that I'm just sitting here going over the fact that I said, wait, I'm having a total forgetful moment of Arian. Is that just a description of. Whether you're white or not, or does Aryan suggest a certain belief system? This is like, this is like I forget what the color yellow is. I know this. You forgot what the color yellow is? I'm, it's as if Amarillo. I have. It's as if I have forgotten it's what it looks Amal- like. Amarillo. Uh, and that's it, not I a slag believe on Asian Arian, people. And I, this will be answered on Twitter. This will be your Twitter feed now. I, I people know. explaining Aryan. I think it is a way to explain the color white. Right. European white person. Yeah. An, an Aryan. Uh, but then I think now uh, it's in our lexicon as, you know, the Aryan Brotherhood, right, which is white supremacist. Aryan youth. Yes, because when I said I'm not truly Aryan, what I meant to say is I'm not truly white pride. But then I wondered if – did I just say I'm not truly white? Uh, I'm not sure. And I don't know if Jews are truly Aryan because I think you guys – it's a nomadic tribal – you know, they're Sephardic Jews. There's right. European Jews. And I stand with Israel. I'm big on the Jews. Great. I'm a, I'm a big <laughs> I'm a big fan of Jews. <laughs> I'm very non-Jew in that uh, I was raised with no religion. I thought you were going to say because you weren't circumcised. And I wasn't circumcised. Yeah. Um, you didn't go to temple. Mm-mm, none I of went that. to a, I went to a, uh, a celebrate Christmas. You do? Mm-hmm. You should. It's I don't know why it's anybody a, does well, it's, it. Honestly, it's a pretty good holiday. It's, it's awesome. It's the better holiday. I think it's rad. Yeah. And let me give you the greatest. Shopping tip of all time. Oh, I, I'm ready. Lay it on me. QVC now. Really? October. Get on it. They are so nice. Huh. They are amazing. You can bang out your whole family. Everything comes in like incredibly wrapped, beautiful things. And you can get like nice stuff. Do you just go to the website or do you have to watch the show? You can just go to the website. And if you ordered, like I ordered last year something. And then today I ordered some stuff for... Um, my sisters and my mom, 
like neat. And it, it looked like, look, it, the days of like, well, look at the shitty shit right. they got. And they still have like bizarre, like Quacker Factory fucking sweatshirts and stuff. But like the Mally cosmetics and stuff. Oh, oh yeah. sister, bang it out now. She's she's good with the cosmetics. Um, I, I've never bought, I know that we're talking about buying something on a website, but I've never bought anything off of TV. But I remember my dad got my mom a necklace for Christmas one year. From the Ivana Trump collection, mm-hmm. it was Class. such a piece of shit. Class, it went it went right back. Really, mm-hmm. mommy knew it was garbage. Well, it had. I mean, I said Ivana Trump on the box, and I think he was like, "Yeah, I got it off of. I saw it on TV, and I ordered it." And uh, yeah, are your parents still together? They they are, despite that. Yeah. And where do they live? Uh, they live in Orange County. That's where I grew up. I dig Orange County. Uh, I was actually just listening to you talk about Orange County and describing it as a bunch of Ed Hardy shirt wearing guys who pump and are not that smart, which I would have to agree with. Yeah, that's I stand by that. Yeah, Gary's that doesn't mean from I don't well. like the ocean and Seal Beach and. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I didn't like it growing up. Um, I felt like, why the hell are we in this place where everyone's the same and awful? And you're alabaster. Like you're almost. You're like. I'm very pale. You're uber what? You're translucent. I'm kind of clear, yeah. Um, Although there are some photos of me uh, as a youngster wearing dolphin shorts, knee-high socks. I had a bowl cut because I wanted my hair like 2D from Facts of Life. Yeah. And I I got it, and I was very tan. Very, very tan. I was like like a small Mexican child. (laughs) Um, We had had gone to Hawaii. Were you trying to be tan to look like 2D? (laughs) No. Kim Fields, ladies and gentlemen. I know. Right? Yeah, of course. Remember the pilot for Facts of Life? There was like 20 chicks in there. I know. Well, the there first was like season. the baseball girl, like with the pigtails, and yeah, she always had Cindy. a mitt. Cindy. There yeah. was a very special episode where Blair <laughs> yeah. accused her of being gay, actually. Really? They tackled some pretty serious topics. And in Mrs. The early Garrett years. had to straighten it out. That's and then right. Clooney comes over to date Joe, and then all hell breaks loose. You know how she straightened it out? Blair came walking down, and she's like, <laughs> Gary is sticking his head in his hand. Don't get me started on Facts of Life. No, it's you, you and me here. Forget that's right. Gary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Blair comes down and Mrs. Garrett says something like, um, like, you know, you must show guys a really nice time, the way you smoke and talk and blah, 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 like suggesting that Blair's a slut. And then Blair's like, no, you don't understand. That's all. I, I'm a tease. Like, it's all just for show. And then um, Mrs. Garrett points out that, you know, she jumped to that conclusion because of the way Blair presents herself, just like how Blair can't know anything about Cindy just because she's mm. into sports. Yeah, don't judge a book by its cover. Exactly. That unless was it's a rad cover. Yeah, or, or unless it says, um, I'm a lesbian. That could be the, <laughs> that, If that were the cover, I feel like that, you know what's inside. Uh, quick trivia. What did Tootie say the bong was for when Mrs. Garrett found it? Jelly beans. Well, that's too easy, right? Hit me with another. Give me some. Of, give me some of Jerry's stand-up act. Uh, I only know the thing about the salad. What's that? Something about uh, like how people with CP are really good at mi- mixing a salad or something What's like CP? that. What's CP? Cerebral palsy. Oh, sorry. I'm MS. I yeah, get confused. I, I, I get very defensive about the inequity. The- <laughs> well, Blair, <laughs> Jerry yeah. would say. I, I can't Please, do it. no, do. I'm trying to remember it. Wait, wait. This is like Blair. Blair. <laughs> Nick knows all of it. Here she comes. She knows oh, about it. Oh, good. Well, Blair. <laughs> it's not your fault, Blair. <laughs> it's not an earthquake. This is how I always walk. You have not had too much to drink. <laughs> this is just me. <laughs> Yay! That was. Amazing. See, that's the type of pie wedge I did not have when I met her. <laughs> Jerry, stand up. Yes! <laughs> uh, yeah, it was all stuff like that. Well, I'm not drunk. This is how I always am. It's not an earthquake. <laughs> At what age did you start doing impressions? Um, I don't know a hard out for like a specific like celebrity impressions, but I remember I saw the movie Stripes when I was eight, and I remember acting it out for my friends in someone's garage. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess that so eight. I remember I remember specifically going, you know, Bill Murray pacing myself, sir, and doing like Sergeant Holka, like winger. I noticed you're always last pacing myself, sir. There's something wrong with us. There's something very very wrong with us. <laughs> Uh, so probably eight, 
And then specific celebrity impressions, I'm not sure. But I remember my first one I ever did was Andrew McCarthy, which is entirely visual, which I'll do it for you. Oh, please. We just had him on the podcast, and I love him. (laughs) I wish people could see this. I love her, man. He's have you do you know him? No. He's when he was in here, he still has that thing with the eyes. He like his eyes glowered at me. Do you My think my clothes fell off? There's <laughs> there's there's certain guys that seem to have and I'm not applying this to Andrew McCarthy. Okay. But there's certain actors where you go like, where did that guy go? There's certain actors that have really just simply assholed themselves out of the business. Yeah, Val Kilmer maybe. Yeah, do you think he's one of them? Well, he didn't seem like an asshole you know what we I didn't spend long enough around well he's here know. for a reason because he's on the comeback trail but I mean yeah, there's a decade a book. right right of nothing like no, he's el- been no lifetime mo- sure I guess that's where assholes go well not, know, maybe not it? Fred Savage Scott Baio those are nice guys that direct right yeah TV shows Scott do you know Scott Baio no he's Fred not- Savage voice of Oswald the octopus if you have children I don't have children, but now I know. I didn't know that. Fred just... Stoller's on it. There's a lot of talent on that little huh. cartoon. How is the programming for the kids? Because I remember when I was babysitting, it was all about Barney, and I wanted to kill myself, the dinosaur. I long for Barney. It's terrible now because yeah. everything's like half animated and half prosthetic face with like like a cart. It'll be a human with like a prosthetic like jaw and chin and then like a cartoon like cloud over their head. Like it's this weird mishmash computer animation. Hmm. Where I long for the like where Sesame Street you go, awesome, got it, puppets, and then here's a cartoon. It's the letter Z. Get it? It's great. Everything's terrific, but uh, it's in the in the seven years between children, it's become abysmal. Like it's just absurd. Like the Bernstein Bears, which is great yeah, for a certain that. age group, but at, I don't know what my child like. It's way too much. Inf- it's like watching Dallas. <laughs> Like, everyone's got names. They go to school, but they go to separate schools. They live in a tree. Like, yeah. just let me see what goes on in the tree, man. Like, the ru- like the book Runaway Bunny. But the like, tree is like the money shot for the bears. Yeah, it, is. it really is. In in bear cartoon world, the tree is the money shot. That's what we learned here yeah. today. And now I had a strawberry shortcake doll, and it was this big plastic strawberry thing that would unfold, and then there was a whole house inside the strawberry. I guess what I'm suggesting is different living situations. I'm all about it. Yeah. Like even Barbie Camper, I long for the days of that. Yes. Where I could set it up and just, you know, have a picnic with my friends. Same. Is the Little it... People Airport, I remember digging that. Everybody was coming and going by my own, by the, my, my hand. Right. My godlike hand. You've just arrived from Denver. Your plane's on time. <laughs> Here's your family waiting to greet you. I am the lord of this little kingdom, you serfs. God. I love that you are a benevolent god slash TSA. <laughs> <laughs> Pat down. Pat down. There's always that one bald little person, mm-hmm. and they just draw, like, two lines on his head, like Charlie Brown. Yeah. Did you have weebles? Uh, no, I always thought they were kind of shitty. Yeah. They weren't very fun. They were I, just egg people. I think my cousins had them, but I, I never bit on that. I was more – I liked the little worlds you could create. And I wasn't into Lincoln Logs because I don't, I don't want to build it. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm I'm a union right. guy. You got to meet my wage. <laughs> Did you like Legos? No, because I still don't because I'm awful at them. Yeah. I don't uh, – you know, there's like a whole Lego culture and Legos appeal to adults as well, I suppose, because you can build – I'm thinking of like at uh, downtown Disney. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Disney Town? Yeah. Downtown. There's like a whole Lego store and it's like, look, the Twin Towers in Legos. Darth Vader. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like some people are like car guys. Right. I'm not a car guy. I'm not mm-hmm. a Lego guy either. I feel like a person who's a Lego person would constantly be yelling at their children not to touch their Legos. I think that's a very fair assessment. And but you know now, what? Go ahead. I really don't like the w- – I didn't know I had so many opinions about this. The one little Lego – What can't Allison complain about? <laughs> Uh-oh. No. It's, you know, <laughs> this is what I'm here for. Which one I've little actually, Lego? I was actually warned recently – by whom? Daniel. Oh. I was warned. Is there an uh, extra mic on? Now I'm, f- I'm in full Adam mode right now. No, okay. I'm just going insane. Uh, warned that perhaps being around Adam so much has m- made me think that complaining is a place to go with my humor, but that my humor is really not about that and don't default into complaining. 
which I thought was a fair point. Although it's I think that he had point, misunderstood but... like what I was suggesting. I was talking about like maybe I'll talk about this on stage. Maybe I'll talk about this on stage. I think he was misunderstanding where I was going with it because it wasn't really going to be about complaining. I'm going to make two assumptions, observations, and questions. I don't Ooh, know if it'll that sounds come. Sounds like six things. But I, okay. I was going to say I don't know if it'll come out to six. I just don't know the proper word to choose. Go go with it. What? Hey, what's the deal with airline yeah. food at its nicest level? Like Seinfeld. It's, oh, parallel park, and could they put the meters any closer together? Right. And what's with the guy that doesn't realize I'm trying to parallel park? I'm going to get right up on your bumper. Like, that's complaining. And then, you know, to yeah, Lisa Lampanelli, has... is there any spick hand jobs in the audience? Right. They're the worst. So right, that's it has sort to be of. Complaining. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fuck, it's hard... fuck that guy. It's hard. You live with him. It's hard to. I will, but. You're the only one that is. Yeah. Hope, in a per... Hopefully. Uh, one would you hope. better be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard to go up on stage and go, don't we all agree on this? How great. <laughs> Unless it's don't we all agree that everything sucks and now we're all complaining together. Yeah. All right. You she know wrote I... me a whole new 40 minutes. I said to her, my wife, I said, I need new material because my special had aired. Can you come up with, because she wrote two chapters in my book and she's done like Tonight Show appearances. She'll write like the, she'll go do this in this order because this will be funny. She was groomed like veal to marry a comic by, <laughs> by her mom, and I couldn't be more happier. Uh, but, you know, she got me onto those murder shows like Dateline when they always go like, she really lit up a room. Like, that's what they say about every person. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was all those commercials about like mobile catheter, vaginal mesh. Yeah. So that, that has become like 40 new minutes by the grace of God that somebody literally went like, here, like handwritten. Right, here's funny. So then it becomes like an acting job. like now. But fortunately, it's funny enough that it's real easy to remember. It's like learning lines from like your favorite movie. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you light up a room. But that's all like we're all complaining together. Like don't we all agree that on these murder shows, they right. always tell me how this person – they just showed me 40 photos of this drippy I mean, say, Perkins yeah, they... waitress with crunchy <laughs> bangs and miscolored teeth. Like I don't think she really lit up a room. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think she's – and yeah. I always go, no one had a bad word to say about her. It's like, well, by my math, there's at least <laughs> one guy right. that couldn't really express it with words, so he had to fucking dismember her. Oh, my God. Guy sounds kind of hot. <laughs> Norm. So anyway, the Legos. The one oh, little Lego. You complain just, a lot. I know. It's not funny. It's from hanging out with Adam. The one, I don't like the one little Lego that just has like the one Lego <laughs> vagina. You know I'm what sorry. I'm saying? No, I, heard, I don't. I just heard Nikki scream yes as loud as she could. Oh, good. She, she knows Get what I mean. Get her on mic. What is she yeah. Well, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Well, Legos There's is like There's one Lego a with grid. a Lego vagina. Well, that's the lady leg. The Lego has a penis and a vagina. It has a groove and it has a thing that sticks out. Yeah, there's a lady part Lego and then the, you connect no. them by putting the boy part into the lady part. Well, each, each Lego has both. Each Lego yes, has a the tiny top, kishi. The, the top is yeah. boy parts. But usually a Lego... It's a tranny world. Nikki, you know what I'm talking about, right? My love, you, you aren't well aware of that, that awful Lego because I, generally when we undo our Lego sets, I actually throw them away because <laughs> I find them perturbing. Yes. So I'm with you, Alex. Why, now, why, though? Why are they so annoying? Is what it because are they? If, it's like a piece they of gravel? They have bad attitudes. <laughs> they're always giving you the hairy eyeball, and they're, they're pretty much just useless. Yes, thank you. What they are is, okay, Jay... Or like are you J or are you JJ? Uh, my friends call me uh, since I'm you're my know. new best friend, JJ, okay. John Jr. JJ. Uh, with nice. A, normally, nice. I, I just tripped off the tongue. With a Lego, you probably imagine the thing that has like a bunch of little grooves, <laughs> a bunch of penises and a bunch of vaginas. Right. Yes. Like a cow's udder. <laughs> yes. But more sexual. Yeah. We're saying that there exists. There are in a big Lego set. There are some that are just like one, like just a, a this so one little tiny thing. So there's two dots. Just one dot. Aha, uh -huh. here we oh. go. Just one dot. Doesn't that just bother you in principle? How weird is it that my wife has absconded with all the one penis, one vagina Legos? That's why you don't know. That's why I don't know. Because they're all gone. Because every time it's I've ever smart. had to put any Legos together, she's, she just tosses them as we go. No. Right. Oh, so that's like for the one weird over here door section of the Millennium Falcon that nobody yeah, cares about. Yeah, exactly. It suggests that man, there's too much creativity. Guys. Can we swear on this? Oh, yeah. We've totally. Screw them. those guys, yeah. man. So back to what I took us off before Hold because on. there was a thing bouncing around my head. 
Twitter and tweets. I think what initially drew me to your podcast was I was having a tough time with some of the comments I was getting. And I don't know what made me aware of the fact that that was something that you also talked about on your podcast. Put your name on it. It's the intro of my podcast. It's yes. the, that plea by Coach Herman Edwards. Put your name on it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, well, so anyway, I was listening and I was relating so strongly. And it was at that point that I was like, I really would love to, to talk to him on my podcast. Um, where are you with all? Like, I feel like I'm getting a bit of a, a thicker skin now. Where are you with all of that? I'm pretty good. It do, It's comical. It's just com- But I also have like. They know everything about you, mm-hmm. and they're, you know, Milkman Mike 411. Yeah, he's a jerk. That's all you know. <laughs> That's all you know. Like, they know everything about you, and especially if you do a podcast especially with any— Especially if you're very open with, about your yeah, stuff. Yeah, with any yeah. honesty on it whatsoever. I, um, I have reached a point, but it was because it was such an avalanche and tsunami of negativity through my own big mouth, getting myself in trouble and getting in, like— bullshit battles like you know because i told people to get fucked and that opens the floodgates to anybody along with those people to come and you know cascade and kill you uh so you block about a thousand people and then they're gone uh and then you just really can make it your own personal place where the only people that exist on your comments or your mentions are people that think you hung the moon yeah, with that, that, that's the way I like to experience Twitter. Yeah, but you just have to block the shit. Out of, right. Like people that go like, yeah, that didn't go the way you planned, blocked. Like even any ounce of whiff of negativity, okay. you're out. I'm so glad that you're saying this because I actually was thinking something that I want to do on this show is ask people. There are certain tweets that I get where I don't know whether to block the person. If someone says something outright negative You should block the person on the show. should be a segment on your show. Oh yeah, that's what I'm thinking. All right, You Mm -hmm. should definitely do that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to need a song. I'm just going to put that out there to the world. Uh, And especially to Trap Dog who does the songs. I'm going to need a song for this segment. Um, See, go ahead and crunch loud. I I hear you. (laughs) I've been sucking on it like chewing tobacco (laughs) between my cheek and gum. Just, Just just eat it. Um, okay. You should get like um, – you can do whatever you want. It's your show. But like anytime there's like a field goal block, the mm-hmm. announcers go crazy. Blocked. Blocked. Oh, that'd be blocked, good. Blocked. That'd be really good. You just get 14 different people screaming blocked. And that's yeah. your – Allison R- Rosen is not your new best friend because you're blocked. I like that. Well, OK. So if anyone says something that's totally shitty uh, or mean or name calling or whatever – I, that person I'll block. Yeah. But there are certain ones where I'm like, well, this person is just expressing their opinion. Like I can kind of tell whether this person is a jerk all the time or this is just something that I didn't like that they said or whatever. And then I think I don't know whether to block them or not. Um, if you go to their timeline, it'll show you three tweets. And usually right. the tweet right immediately prior to yours is someone else's podcast with something else negative to say. And you realize this is just a negative person. You can block them. So go yeah. ahead. So okay. you want to run some by me? Well, here's just one. There's this one that I got earlier. Um, okay. Zach Glyer. It ruins the podcast when you talk politics, clearly having a predetermined view on everything. Unbearable. Now, the unbearable is what makes me think I want to block this person. Before that, I feel like if you don't agree with my politics, that's okay. You're – like – He could have expressed this in a much shittier way, and I've received tweets where people are expressing those things in a shittier way. But then again, why keep him in my timeline? He's not saying anything nice. I'll tell you why. Okay. Because he's a listener. Yeah. He's a listener. He's talking about Adam's show, though. Oh. (laughs) But still. But if it was – well, what about for you? I don't talk – well – you're going to air out all of Adam's, you know, potential assassins, and you're like, I have none. I live in a perfect opium den world where people say nice things about me and lay on silk couches. One of my Greg Proops. Why couldn't Wait. I just say that much easier? Sorry. That's okay. No, no. I mean, he's talking to me, but the podcast he's talking about is Adam. He's talking about me having. To, I was t- yesterday. I talked about the vice presidential debate, mm-hmm. uh, and so he's talking about what I said about that, saying that I'm making Adam's show unbearable by talking about my politics, which because he doesn't agree with them, he feels are predetermined. Versus if he agreed with what I had to say, he'd think it was well thought out. Uh, he's a fuckhead for sure. There's no downsides to sound. I don't think downside there's any to downside him. to blocking anybody. It's just that you know I lose one follower or something. 
Well, yeah, but you don't care about followers as much as you care about listeners because hopefully you're putting on the version of the show that you wish to put on. Right. So if that guy thinks that your politics are unbearable, therefore he's not going to come over right. to this side of the yard right. to listen to Alison Rosen as your new best friend, then so long. Right. So you think I should block him? Do you get what I'm saying, though, about I how think you should he's ask not him, as shitty as I think you should people? ask him, do you listen to my podcast? Should I say Jay Moore wants to know if you listen to my podcast? But why Why am I now in your <laughs> circle of negativity? <laughs> I, I will say this about my podcast. I, I won't drag you into it. I have completely, really tried to pioneer a completely positive environment mm-hmm. because so many of our compatriots – are just fucking mean. Yeah. And take that, it's almost bullying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I always like, you know, like I don't, th- like when Brody was on, like I don't think that was funny. Like I needed this guy to know, like, I love you, bro. Like whenever you want, like let's hook, let's do it. So I would ask that person if he listens, does it keep you from listening to my podcast? Right. Because you talk a lot of politics. I don't, no. I, I've never heard you talk any politics on this. I don't Ever. talk. I don't, and I don't talk very many politics on Adam's show either. But it's you that talk there are enough people... with that guy; it made him crazy. Yeah, so it was, was like find, a minute and a half. I would find out. I would ask that guy. Hopefully, he doesn't keep you from listening to my podcast. Yeah, and then his response will, will determine will be met with either "I allow you to live, sir," mm-hmm. or "Seize him, have right. him washed, and sent to my tent for a beheading." <laughs> right. So either I will. Not block him, or it'll be Gary. Oh, you. Hey, hey, go fuck yourself. I mean, in, I'm going to say that to him regardless, but I might block him or I might not. Look, that's uh, the thing about politics. I will never tell anyone who I vote or am voting for ever in my life, ever again, ever, ever, ever. Because yeah. you're either right, and I've now I've won like your pat me on the head fucking bullshit acceptance because mm-hmm. I joined your crew. Or <laughs> here comes Jay. He thinks the other one is right, and he's so, he doesn't even get it. And before I said any of that, we were just friends. So never again. Yeah. Never. I actually hate – I hate talking about politics, especially in my private life. No one moves. Mm-hmm. No one ever takes a step to the left or to the right. No. Actually, uh, aforementioned Daniel and I don't – we agree on a lot of things. We, we're on different sides politically. Uh, and yet still in love, which I, is weird, but every now and then... Not to that wacky Carville couple. No. I don't understand them. I don't know either. I don't get that. Uh, but recently we started talking about something and it just like it went from here's a morning where we're getting along to now uh, I, I feel just really agitated. And then at that point I was like, I think we need to maybe not have these kind of conversations, which I hate saying that. But well, it's just like, you don't have to say is... it. You can just not be a part of it because you're never going to change his mind. And he's right. never he's never he's never going to say anything where you go, wow, I never really thought of the debt ceiling that way. Yeah, because you it's just I think it's how your hard drive is installed. I just think it's how you're born. Right. I think you're right. I think you're right. See, that's that. Why can't everything go that way? Because we don't live together. Yeah, you're right. You know. We no, you're right. <laughs> no, you're right. Can we argue about who's right? What made you want to do a podcast? Uh, it's the Cranberries album. Everyone else is doing it, so why can't we? Mm-hmm. And everyone else is doing it. And I had a couple opening acts that are like, will you do my podcast? So like in between shows, I'm doing this person's podcast. And then I'm getting feedback on Twitter like, you were great on your opening acts. No, no opening act that you know. Uh, podcast. And I thought uh, – and selfishly, I wanted more to sell more tickets when I go on the road. And the whole game in show business is how do you make money when you're not making any money? Um, do you feel like there is a backlash against comedians who start podcasts? And the reason I'm asking is because I get interviewed and there are the, there's like a certain set of questions I get, which are these very philosophical, thinky questions about the direction podcasting is going. And I hate answering them because I'm like, these are – it's sort of – it's an interesting note for me as an interviewer that like these are the kind of questions not to ask someone because it's hard to answer. Nothing interesting comes out of it and it's like way too – um, you know, like be a magic eight ball. But uh, one I of the questions that, I, is okay. about uh, comedians podcasting and what that does to podcasts and whatever. And like I, I was well, never we're the aware. Only one, we are the podcasting. Like, I mean, as much as you want to think 
you know, BBC One and World News is this riveting podcast. It's not. It's, <laughs> right. it's Joe Rogan, Mark Marin, Adam Carolla, Jay Moore, Allison Rosen, Tom Sikor. It's the Thank whole. Thank you for putting me in there. Well, it'd be weird if I left you out sitting in front of you. Yeah, I would. Uh, but that's what podcasting is, is people, you know, it's entertainment. And it's replacing radio slowly, slowly, mm-hmm. slowly. You know, there's a little less sand on the beach as time goes by. Every time there's a little less sand on the beach. So I think you should be complimented that they're asking you those questions because you're a viable comic podcaster that they feel is worthy of said questions. I sound like an asshole complaining about those questions. No. And, and when they ask – because you got to understand also everyone is the t- – right now is the tip of the spear. Like this is so brand new. Nobody even knows what the hell is going on. Like Kevin Smith is the guy that introduced me to all of it and explained to me. I said, so this is the future? He's like, no, bro. It's like right fucking now. This is the present. Like this is Coca-Cola stock, 1952. Like this is it. Like we're all paddling and the waves right behind us. Um. So I haven't really noticed I, – I, the, the, what I've noticed when people ask me questions is they're genuinely completely intrigued by like what is this? Like what are you doing? And they've heard about it from other people and then they listen to it. It's this weird on-demand, I'll listen to it whenever I want, get the More Stories app and uh, listen to it whenever you want thing. So I – I, I mean, you know, hey, if you were starring on like a Nick Jr. show, they were going to ask you about Nick Jr. things as well as your stand-up comedy. But yeah. instead, you're the star of your own podcast. Um, you made a joke earlier about your podcast not being a TV show yet. Is that something that you actually want to do? Or think oh, yeah. Doing? Yeah. Let's get paid. Let's all sell out at the same time. Let me tell you that this – star- been trying to forever. Yeah. Starbucks is happy to present, you know, Jay Moore's Miller Genuine Draft podcast. I'm all about it. But do you want it to be a visual thing? As well. Like, would you want to do it? Like, like I would like to have a talk show on TV. That's sort of where I want this to go. I used to think that was a death sentence. And now that I'm realizing with children, I could simply just stay home and make some money. It's awesome. And um, I'm saying everything like a question, like a Valley Girl. Mm-hmm. Like I'm right. from Burbank. Right. Okay. As if. Oh, I'm God. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I would love it. And that is that is the end game, that we all just sit down on some channel and do this as a talk show. Mm-hmm. Do you um, still go out for a, like what? What else are you working on? I just did a pilot for TV Land, uh, multi-camera like sitcom, live audience pilot. Waiting to see if that gets picked up. What's it about? It's called Brothers in Law. I'm like the wacky, nothing bothers me guy mm-hmm. that got engaged to the uptight guy's sister. Uh, Jeff Pearson's in it. Great cast. Very fun. It'd be great to do. It's on TV land, so I don't think you're under that microscope of like, ah, your numbers are off. You're out. So that, I'm in the fabulous Burt Wonderstone with Steve Carell, Jim Carrey, Steve Buscemi, James Gandolfini, Olivia Wilde, I think is Mm -hmm. her name. I think it is. I don't know the girls that much. I'm sorry. Um. Yeah, so I play Rick the Implausible. I play a really bad comic magician. Very small role, <laughs> but it, it's really funny and super fun Like to ad-lib. When you're ad-libbing with Steve Carell, it's like, oh, my God. Like, they trust me to do this. Yeah. When I, The first time I did um, Jiminy Glick with Martin Short. And I it, love Martin Short. And Michael McKeon. It was Bernie Brillstein, rest his soul. They just sort of went, you sit here and we'll go. And there was no prep at all. And I realized, oh, my God, they have just completely trusted me with this. It's Jiminy Glick. It's Mm -hmm. Martin Short and Michael McKeon. And they're going, and then you'll just do – you'll just get caught up in it. And you won't fuck it up because that's why you're here. And that that was a big moment of other people think I'm as great as I think I am. (laughs) (laughs) And then the Steve Carell movie, you go, oh, my God, like I'm ad-libbing with Steve Carell and Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. Steve Buscemi, by the way, alarmingly funny. As like no one has any idea how freaking funny Steve Buscemi is. Like he could easily be a leading comedy man. Do you always think you're really funny, or do you ever sometimes doubt it? No, I, you know I think that's what makes me unlikable to many, and that is I'm pretty sure of it all. And I think always. Yeah. My wife says I'm an actor who learned how to do comedy. I always thought I was a comic that figured out how to act. Mm -hmm. And her reasoning was, I don't 
I don't have that hole that comics have that like, ugh, what am I doing with my fucking life? I suck. Like I don't, I never feel that way. Mm-hmm. And I, I was talking to Adam about it too. Of like, he doesn't seem to have it either. There's no, right. Like, let's just go get after it. Let's just go have a good time. Like, why do I have to be damaged to go up and make an audience laugh? So, are are you looking for validation though? Well, that's the only reason you do it. That's the only reason we're here. That's mm-hmm. as in, ent- entertainers, right? You know, no, on this earth. <laughs> on this earth is look at me, look at me, look at me. And when they don't valid, like when I went, I went to Louisville, did not sell. The amount of tickets, I mean, by half that I'm used to selling, I won't be back to Louisville So because they didn't validate me. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason I play Irvine twice a year. It's always fucking full. Right. Super full in Orange County and Denver and Boston and, you know, Jersey and New York. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I definitely need validation. That's that's one of my f- big flaws when I take that fearless moral inventory of myself as I'm an egomaniac that constantly needs validation. But I don't. Um, it doesn't sicken me about me. What sickens me about me is my inability to not interrupt and shut up and just, I wish I was like the strong silent type. What is, what is it that makes you interrupt? It's impulse control. I just, it's terrible. It's terrible. And if you would just think a second before you spoke, you would just avoid some, anytime you ever misunderstood, it's like, oh my God, like it's just a word, a phrase, using something wrong and, like we said earlier, like hanging around other comics, suddenly you're just this interloper because you're just happy, you're not depressed, and you're just having a good time and telling people, look at these fucking assholes, look at you, nice shirt, what a, f- oh, boy, you're ironic. And that guy's <laughs> like, oh, I thought I was ironic, I hate you. <laughs> but um, it is, it's me. and it's. But I, you know what? I challenge any comic listening or any human being listening to say – on a public forum, what your exact weakness and what the negative parts of your personality are. I, I think, you know, I'll take credit for the negative parts, but at the same time, you know, uh, very actively trying to change and be better and be gentler. Mm-hmm. Gentler is the big thing. Be gentle, JJ. Dial it back a little. <laughs> and that's what's great about. When I met Nick, it was the first time I didn't feel like I had to entertain everybody. I was able to be still for the first time. Why do you think that was? Because the race was over. Finish line. It's all gravy now. Do you think it's also because you felt... Why don't you just tell me what you want me to think it is? Because that's where this is going. No, control that impulse too well. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was gonna say I'm not gonna put words in your mouth, but but could it have been that you felt like she got you right away? Oh, she completely got me. And like, so maybe there was less. You weren't trying to demonstrate who you were as much. It would have been absurd for me to behave the way I had behaved around her. And people say to her all the time, and it, it's not a good thing when people go like, it "Must be fucking crazy in your house," because it makes her go, "Well, what do you do when you're not here?" That people think our house is so crazy. Yeah. Our house is like <laughs> – it's like – it's so quiet. And if I acted the way I act like on a set, like that's kind of like my war paint. Like I go and I'm the guy that goofs off and we have a great time and I'm loud and I know the – you know, I, I know what crew members from where and like I talk about his favorite team and stuff. But then when you go home, like that's a soup. you can – it's quiet in my house. I mean mm-hmm. it's real quiet. It would – I'd be committed if I acted – the way I act like at a club in the green room at my house. Right. But it's not like an on-off switch. It's just this is real life and here, got to dance, got to sing. Well, th- that's the thing I think about comedians or actors who are also comedians is that when your career is being funny, it becomes – you're very aware of how it is a job. And then when you're just at home, you don't have that urge to be putting on a show like that. I'm saying something super obvious. Yeah. I mean, I, but I always felt the need to carry the load and entertain and tell everybody like, hey, waka waka. And then I finally met someone who knew all the punchlines before I could get them out. <laughs> so it would be a fool's errand mm-hmm. to try to be like, hey, what's with this guy on TV? Like, it's just, I mean, that's, I guess what 
being madly in love is about is somebody that you you both know what's funny. Like when you're out with your friends and you know you just look at something, you start laughing. It's like that all. It, it's that's how it is. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, you got sober in ninety six. Uh, nineteen ninety eight. Ninety eight. May fifth, nineteen ninety eight. But uh, I did not put them all in a row those years. There are a few, <laughs> a few detours, a few trips so, to the dentist. Right. What? And Nyquil is sold over the counter. Yeah, I was going to ask, what was your, what were you doing before? Beer is what got me in. Nyquil got me out and back in, and then Vicodin got me out and back in. Um, is is it a struggle now? No. It, you know what's a struggle is my mind, at the the addict mind, and getting up in other people's business and. Wondering the well, what happens here? It becomes like this Winchester mystery house <laughs> of what these people could be doing. When at the end of the day, that's their fucking business. It doesn't concern me. Yeah. And that, that's it. Was like this April, where I had like this epiphany of like I have to go. Like I gotta just really slow it down and sort of just realize everything's okay because I was just sort of up in everybody's business and way, you know, what someone says behind your back is none of your business. I don't know how that's applicable. How could it not be my business? Yes. Why? Why does that person feel this way? How do I make it better? What if I get a note to this person and that, will they get it? Will they receive it the right way? If only, you know what? The person doesn't like you. Turn the page. I feel like I'm inside my own head right now. I I have that. It's it's like a crazy hypervigilance that can turn and manifest as paranoia almost. Uh, For me. Yeah, and then when Twitter, when people are tweeting you yeah. the other end of the argument, you know, 15 times a day, it's like you, you try to staunch the bleeding. But it's the thing about Twitter and the internet and podcasting and radio and television, nothing exists until you personally put a light on it. Yes. Like any feud yes. that I have, no one has any idea what I'm talking about until I say, like, this happened and revisit it, which I will not. Then all of a sudden people go, oh, first of all, who is the person you're even talking about? Right. Second of all, what is this thing you guys are arguing about? Third of all, that's <laughs> fucked up, JJ, or maybe you could. So it, it, like that took me a long time. Like I was perpetuating so much of the negativity coming my way. Like when you're in a hole, stop digging. Mm-hmm. I never knew to stop digging. I just kept digging like, no, seriously, you got just with this shovel, like I, I'll but switch it, shovels. It, yeah, because it feels wrong to not be digging. Somehow it feels yeah. like it feels like if you the idea of just ignoring something and just letting it be there feels wrong, even though that's kind of the only move you have. But it does become sublime. I've reached that. I've reached when someone tweets me something horrible and I know exactly where it's from. I know like what crew mm-hmm. or like what group or like what type of people or what part of the country it came from. It just makes me laugh because I'm watching a child play with a puppy in a yard and so I win. It's also I realized they're not it's not you they're talking about even though it it is you, you know, technically that they're talking about. It's like they're just reacting to someone in the public eye. They don't know who you are even though you're and this is where it gets confusing though. It's like but but I'm I, so honest. I mean I'm putting so much of myself out there, but it's still they're reacting to like something but succinct, about them. Yeah, but succinctly I think I can help you with that. Oh, please. Is that is it's not so much you specifically as much as it's for the other guy that they've aligned themselves with. Yeah. Like we're all Republicans, you're a liberal douchebag. Fuck you. Like, it's not you. It's this crew. And I just use that as an example. Nobody knows anything about our politics because we're not talking about it on the show. Well, I am a douchebag. Um, yeah, it's, I get I get amazing, like, Hollywood douche, liberal douchebag tweets. And I'm like, have you read my fucking timeline? Like, who? Like, right. all you have to do is go back four tweets and see. Uh, they haven't like, read your timeline, though. That's no. it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but you must get it bad because you are from... You, you're from the coaching tree, to use a football term. Oh, good. You're, you're from the coach. You're Adam. You're a branch from the tree yeah, of Adam. Yeah. So people are like, you know what? You know, they don't understand that you're funny and you're talented and you've gotten your own show. They think like this is just like your Yoko. Like you just got this thing. <laughs> like this is just keep her happy. 
like give her her own thing, which they don't realize you would have come to this on your own anyway. Oh, because... I had this on my own before in a different form. I had. This I mean, show. let me finish. Anyway, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know. I didn't know it. Yeah, I'm not uh, gonna lie to you. No, no, no. You so you, have, I'm but... sure you get. Uh, a lot of people that are like, I'm with Ace Man. What the fuck is she yeah, doing? Yeah, you're right. They they do see me as an interloper. They see it as like any time that I'm talking is a moment that he's not talking. Although often there's times that we're both talking. Uh, what they have to understand is that you're out of the sea of humanity. You're the one person that Adam has said, this is the only human I can fucking stand sitting next to me over the long haul. So their anger is so misguided. Right. They're going against Adam. It wasn't by like he shit was like, how did it wasn't like he's like, how did this woman get yeah, here? You I guess 15, we'll just let her stay. Yeah, like you he selected me. You weren't the fifteenth caller. Right. Adam said her out of everyone. Her. Yeah. Thank you. And um, You're welcome. Fuck them. All right. So what's the thing uh just me or everyone? Is this is that the thing you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Because I got that. I'm losing sometimes I Ponder on something I have thought or done. Is it just me or everyone? All right. Uh, wait, I have to know how soon do you need to get out of here so we can make this pretty tight? Couple, two minutes. Oh, okay. Tight. All right, let's do it real fast. I put off going to the bathroom as long as possible so each time is an emergency. I don't do that. I do not either. Okay. But I do do it to stretch my bladder because I have a small bladder. Do you really? But I'm 42. Obviously, it hasn't worked. Uh, MCX1110. I, oh, wait. No. See, put your name on it. Like, who the fuck is that? Are you a fucking droid or a human being? Well, these are the people that are. T- these are the people <laughs> that tell us we suck. MCX110, the fucking droid data from the planet Tatooi, thinks you fucking su- Like, put your fucking first and last name on that shit and then tell us we suck. Here, here. Sorry. The only thing I'll say is possibly on Twitter his full. You know that could just be his Twitter handle. But anyway, we're not going to do that one. We're just going to we are going to cherry pick. Uh, let's see. Whenever I no uh, Cosmo de Mo- no uh, no. Um, okay, Colonel Siren. When a movie does a timed sequence and it goes longer than reality, I get really annoyed. I've, I've never, never even noticed no, that in my I life. I haven't either. Brian Regan's got that great bit, or maybe it's Dennis. I think it's Dennis Regan when. The words go across the screen like mm-hmm. in a galaxy far, far. I get anxiety that I'm not going to finish it in time. <laughs> yeah, uh, that I do though. All that, right, that one I do too. And then, but I, I know what this. Gary, no one's talking about. to you. She looked at me, asshole. I did. She, she, she looked at you the whole opinion. time. No, she. I participate in this I'm part, Mister. I know the format. See, impulse <laughs> control. Ooh, God. See, that was. Good. All right, time out. Perfect example. Gary and I only know each other from like setting this up. Uh huh. He knows nothing of my personality. I don't know what he's ever heard about me. And I said, no one's fucking talking to you, Gary. Right. Like for that, that's a human being. What Perfect example. Big fan, by the way. Yeah, but I almost just fucking blew it. Because for all I know, that guy goes, I heard he was a fucking dick. And then he says, no one's t-. like he does. Maybe he doesn't know I'm kidding. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. But in this little tiny room, we all it's a huge room. Actually, I do mine for my fucking garage. He knew I was kidding, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. but a lot, but now do you understand yeah, exactly? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. So now, like, there's a guy on some other podcast that goes, man, fuck that guy. You know what I did? I have diarrhea all day, and that guy yells at me. All right. So, <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't have that problem either. One time, Fast and the Furious, they talk about the 10 second race over and over again. It takes 46 seconds. Yeah, they can't all be Nick of Time, can they? Because that movie was exactly the time with Johnny Depp. Jonathan Vance, if someone asks me for cash or change and I don't have any, I'll pat or insert my hands in my pockets before answering. I do it. I don't know if I... Well, yeah, if someone asks me for cash or change, I would actually look in my sorry, wallet. Sorry, you pat. No, you pat like, sorry, you do the pantomime of like, these are my pockets, do I keep my change? Right. And by Like if you can't say, okay, what do you call the, what is it when you have like hair on your upper lip and your on your chin? With well, that type of beard, what's that called? Um, what is it? Lip. Not like mutton chops. A goatee? Yeah. There's, you're the okay. first person ever to say it without touching their face. Oh. <laughs> People are incapable of saying goatee without going like this. Women as well, though? Everyone? Everyone. So huh. I, that's, you're the anomaly here. I'm, I'm a weirdo. Because anybody, when they're like, I don't have any me. money, you yeah. pat your pockets to show them this. If I had money, right. this is where I would be keeping it. Right. And I'm letting you know this is where my empty place of no money is. Maybe I should be patting my imaginary purse. 
because that's where mine would be. Yeah, they'll, but that might be, look a little weird. It does. It looks like I'm playing Drop it a like it's hot. banjo. <laughs> Lady humps. <laughs> All right. Uh, degenerate gambler. When living alone, I tend to sleep on the couch instead of the bed. Just me. Uh, that is not just you. Because I have talked about this before. I do a weird thing where in the middle of the night, if I can't sleep, I'll get up and I'll go sleep on the couch. And then I'll go back, I'll go back and forth between yeah, my bed and the couch. Yeah, not just you, a degenerate gambler. I agree. All right. That was a very fast just me or everyone. I love uh, Dan OCN. Okay. Whenever I see a car in a parking lot late at night, I think two guys are secretly <laughs> hooking up in the bushes. I've never thought that. I don't think in the bushes. I think they're hooking up in the car. Yeah. Because they're on the down low. That's right. <laughs> I often That's do. That's the one I like. <laughs> Anytime guys are secretly, straight guys are secretly blowing each other, that is the pinnacle of comedy to me. Farts are to me. Farts are funny, but not as funny as two guys with kids and wives, like in a Wendy's parking lot, like, like blowing each other, <laughs> like real quick, because I got to get home because yeah. I got soccer practice in the morning. <laughs> like that's hysterical, but they're straight boners, and I put straight in quotes. <laughs> like we're not gay, we're just in a right. part like it's cold yeah. out. I'm not going to stand outside the car and talk to you, and while we're here, I'll heat my mouth with your fucking penis. It's true. Do you think they would go back and forth, or would one always be the heater and one the penis? I think I just figured this out. I, I sometimes they go back and forth, but I I had gay neighbors who the thing was like they the turn on was for them to blow you. Oh. And I always thought you'd want like a straight guy or somebody to to blow right. to be blowing you. But it's like no, that's a penis. I need it. I want I wanted to heat my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Did they ever proposition you? Uh, no, and if they did, it was just completely fun and great, and they were really great guys. I mean, I'm, I'm such a on the waiting list and friend of the gays. Like anytime <laughs> I'm ever propositioned, it's always like you got the wrong party, sweetheart. But I sure appreciate the answer. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to think those are my people. All right. Well, you have to go. How are you with the gays? Do they like you? I I like the gays, and I think they like me, but not as much as um, they like Chelsea Handler. In terms of, I mean, not like gays and gay people in my life uh, yeah. is different, but I mean, in terms of like an audience that would be attracted to me, um, I think I'm she's not. she's more snarky. I'm not bitchy enough. And yet I think I'm a real cunt. So it's weird. <laughs> that's not, I mean, that's probably 101 on the 101 names I would apply to. No, I don't think that makes the top 1,000. Like, I'm, I'm not at all. No, you're not. I'm really you're not. You're very sweet. Thank there's you. An, there's all, but there is like that internal monologue E or quality about you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's. I know you mean that as a compliment. I mean it pragmatic. You already explained it about yourself. Yeah. Like I better think this through. It probably oh, right. can't be yeah. good. And I'm yeah. sure I'm not going to help if I just say my opinion right now. Well, it's yes, it's but it's not so gloomy. It's just I am very afraid of conflict. Like I'll offer my opinion all, all the time. It's if someone is being aggressive. If there's aggression in the room – uh, and any of it is sort of directed at me. I'm, I just I can't deal with it in the moment. Yeah, very, or very rarely. And you shouldn't I? have to either. But I think that it's a skill to be able to, though. It's also, but it's a skill not to. Okay. You, th you think Richard Gere's yelling back at people? You think the Dalai Lama's going, "Fuck you"? That's not what I said, dude. Yeah, no, I don't. You know what I mean? Like all the people we admire somehow are able to just lay back in the cut. Richard and Gere choose. and well, the Dalai Lama. I'm just trying to think of people that seem enlightened upon You're first right. glance. You're right. No, they practice like non-reaction, non-violence. Russell I, Brand is a guy that you would think would be very quick to anger, but I don't. I pretty much. I would guess. I would gamble. He sits many of those arguments out. Yeah. And waits. Yeah. But I think that is what you should embrace because that is you. You're right. It'd be easier than trying to be someone else. Yeah. You're you you are the person that thinks things through. And you, you know what? Measure twice, cut once. That's you. That is me. Thanks, Jay. You Jay. measure four times <laughs> before you make that cut. If it involves other people. If it involves any sort of housework, then no. I just cut and then hope for the best. That's fine. It's your house. But if it's people and emotions, then I'm Daniel, not. it's her house, bro. <laughs> I just right. want you to know that. That's her house. <laughs> and he seems to think that we are both going to be taking the garbage out. <laughs> What? No, that's there are guy jobs and gal jobs, yeah. and if you got a problem taking the garbage out, 
And you know what? Well, he hasn't expressed that. I'm just saying sometimes he there's a bag and he won't take it out. And uh, I'll think to myself, that's – hello. Don't fall asleep at the wheel here. Maybe I need you to say, could you please take out this bag when you get a chance? Probably. Yeah. But see, it would take me – We're dumb. Two days to get up the nerve to say that. Really? Uh, With your soulmate? Yes and no. I because I'm 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 always afraid of this being man a bitch. is a penis heater. This is your no, personal I'm, heater. I thought I'm the heater. Sometimes it goes both ways. I don't. He's I'm a not penis com- heater. I'm I'm not comfortable actually getting into the specifics of your sex life, but I mean, this is the guy <laughs> that you choose to heat and vice oh, versa. Yeah. Right. So I'm just saying he's not up. heating my penis. <laughs> you know <laughs> that what? I'm aware of. It'd be a lot more interesting if he was. That's the, your kind of humor, but a little different. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. I mean, that's that's an exaggeration. Daniel, take out the trash. I'm just I'm learning how to communicate, and along the way, I make everything a little more complicated. Because I'll be like, um, I just um, I, I don't have this. Uh, uh. Ugh. I don't do the uh. That's just my reaction. That to was me. you doing your impression of dice. And <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you fucking non-trash taking out animal. Come on, Danny, huh? I need to defend the fact that it's not like he really doesn't take the trash out. All I'm saying is, I maybe I feel guilty that I don't want to take it out. Okay, um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I love the podcast. I and, love your uh, podcast. We'll just keep. We'll make a pact that we're going to bathe in positivity. Yes, we're shaking, we're shaking on, on, it. on it. I and know. You have a lady shake. I like it. Thanks. That was very, like, Pygmalion. He just, after after all the lessons, you didn't give me, like, the Kristen Johnson, like, all right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah, the Kool-Aid shake. I, oh, yeah. I'm one of the fucking guys. No, you're a lady. I and did you not accordingly. cup my balls, and I'm not going to hawk up phlegm anywhere. That's nice. I, I don't do that. All right. I'll all talk right. to you soon, yeah. my love. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. I love you. <laughs> I love you, too. Why are mommy and daddy fighting? <laughs> We had a good time, but now we gotta go. Thank you for choosing the Allison Rosen Show. Allison Rosen is your new best friend. Digital.